السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله زرقان ان شاء الله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمه oh, الله وبركاته yes, I'm love finally um, guys uh, brothers and sisters as you can see none of us are sheikh yasir qadi um, and you know you guys all obviously also came to benefit and see him he is literally he was coming from orlando his flight got delayed but he's in a land and come and he's going join us. That's how much he loves all of you. Um, and and I, I kind of like made him feel really bad. I said, the entire country is here to see you. And you're not coming. And he's like, okay, I'll be there. So he, inshallah, when he lands, if he makes it on time, he'll join us. If not, then we'll see him tomorrow, inshallah. He'll have, um, actually, he might do two sessions tomorrow. That's what I kind of like. If you don't come today, you got to do two tomorrow type of thing. So inshallah, it'll work out, inshallah ta'ala. With that being said, everyone, um, inshallah, who was here for our first two um, sessions, the last two nights? You guys were here? Were they enjoyable? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Was it beneficial? Yeah. Okay, alhamdulillah, inshallah, the goal is to hopefully make... Uh. <laughs> so that's without me even asking. Imagine if I ask. <laughs> so today's session, um, we wanted to make the goal of the session as it is the... I mean, ending, the ending of these types of events are always bittersweet for the attendees and the students. But I'll be honest with you, it's almost it's equally, if not more bittersweet for, for myself, for sure, all the instructors that come. I mean, I've been here for like the last five days as well, somehow, like I've been here. Um, and meeting everyone that's come from different places, meeting your families, seeing your kids, this, this is a family. And then you imagine what the family of the community of the Sahabas and the Prophet was like, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Their hearts were cleaner than ours. They were more pure than us. They had better character than us. They loved the Prophet more than us. But even that came to an end. Because the reality of, of, of every beginning, every beginning does have an ending in this world. And the only reason, the only way that the endings of this world became easy for them is because they understood, they already, they already had a clear understanding of what the next beginning looked like. They had, they, they had a pure image, illustration, blueprint of it. That now next we meet the Prophet, then Abu Bakr, then Umar, then Uthman, radiallahu anhum. This program will come to an end tomorrow night, but this is a lifelong journey. But as it comes to an end, there are certain etiquettes, certain important lessons, certain important points that we need to discuss to make sure we end the process correctly. Through the Qur'an and through the lives of the Prophets and through the lives of the Salaf, why is it important to make sure that the ending is done correctly? That's, that's what we're going to speak about tonight, just a general theme. Is that okay with everyone? Is that okay? Okay, I mean, if you guys said no, like, uh, oh, I'm not sure how that was going to change stuff. But I love the fact that you guys think that, you know, this is shura. It is. It is shura. Um, but before we do that, just to start off a little bit, you know, softer. I know I got a little heavy. I apologize, everyone. Um, but as a softer note, if what we did yesterday as well, we asked the mashayikh how the previous few days were, where they came from, how they've been, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about... Really? This is probably the mic. They're saying that it's hard... Um, Ibrahim, they're saying that it's hard for them to hear me with the mic. Is it because I'm just really close to them? It's no? It's all good. It's so we'll make it work. We'll make it work, inshallah. I'll, I'll, I'll speak... Differently, <laughs> different language, you know. Um, but we start from the right side. Sheikh Ahmed, Sheikh Ahmed Billu is joining us from LA. Why, why did I deserve a round of applause for? He's from LA. That's it. Like, why is it so special? Uh, but Sheikh Ahmed, welcome for joining us. If you can tell us how your week has been, where you're coming from, and. Um, how you feel? How do you feel being here? The environment, attendees, and students, and so on and so forth. You want to share a few moments with us? We really appreciate it, Sheikh. Salam alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wasabihi wa nistan nabi sunnati ila yom din. Coming from California, walillahi alhamd, the fourth holiest place. Alhamdulillah. Um, but subhanAllah, I got in, it's been less than uh, 24 hours. I got in today at Fajr time. And I've been here for just a few hours now. And alhamdulillah, thumma alhamdulillah, uh, this is my third knowledge retreat, right? We started in Dallas. Then may Allah forgive us, we went to Michigan. <laughs> and alhamdulillah, we're, we're back in Dallas. 
feel safe again. <laughs> Please, please let me know how many knowledge retreats have you had in uh, California? Hey, and, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> hold on. And, and you know why people clap for you, right? The fact that you managed to retain your iman in California. <laughs> <Yeah>. We're <laughs> celebrating that, alhamdulillah. I got the right teammate today. I don't have my brother, but Sheikh Nabi is a bigger brother. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Just, I mean, to, to get things on the record, Sheikh Ahmed and I, alhamdulillah, we are both very privileged to uh, study together at the Islamic University of Medina. So our relationship goes back decades, no jokes. SubhanAllah, the early 2000s is when we were in Medina together, alhamdulillah. Okay. So it's a big fadl of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us together here in uh, Dallas Sharif, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, no, alhamdulillah. Sheikh Naveed came from Canada, mashallah. Make dua, he gets his green card, inshallah. <laughs> I will keep sneaking back in even if they don't, inshallah. Uh, on, on a serious note, Wallahi, it is, uh, it is inspiring, it is uplifting to see so many people uh, dedicate five days coming from so many different places, whether it's the East Coast, whether it's the West Coast, Midwest, or you're local here from Dallas. SubhanAllah, just to see that love for ilm, right? For us as teachers, as instructors, it is inspiring. It, it pushes us to be better. It pushes us to work harder. It pushes us to improve in our teaching, in our ability to convey the knowledge. So honestly, and I don't think this is my sentiments only, but I think all of us and all of the instructors, many times you guys thank us for our sacrifices and leaving our families, but in reality, we should be thanking all of you. We should be thanking all of you for your dedication, for your sacrifice, for, for the time, whatever it is that you've sacrificed, time away from family, time away from for, uh, work, or just, you know, relaxation and sleep. Honestly, from the bottom of my heart, subhanAllah, I came on a, uh, I I came on a red eye. I left LA at like 1 a.m. I got here at 6 a.m. And honestly, yesterday, because I, I had a packed day, I was thinking, I was like, why, why did I do this to myself? Why am I doing, honestly, like, why am I doing this to myself? I got home yesterday after a long day, I got home at like 10.30 and I was like, SubhanAllah, I have like an hour and a half at home right now, I have to get to the airport. I was like, why am I doing this to myself? But SubhanAllah, seeing all of these faces, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, Wallahi, it reminds me why we do this, why you know, we make the sacrifices that we make. Sheikh Mikail taking you know, time away from his family. Um, Mufti Abdul Wahab, MashaAllah, I don't think he sleeps. <laughs> ever, no, like literally, ever, you know? MashaAllah, he is like the true energizer bunny, MashaAllah. And Sheikh... I appreciate that, Sheikh. man. And honestly, you know, uh, someone I consider a brother, uh, an older brother, Sheikh Neved, coming all the way from Canada, and all of the other instructors. So just from the bottom of my heart and for all the other instructors, we want to thank you for making the sacrifice and inspiring us to be better at what we do. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you, protect all of you, and continue to keep all of you on this path of knowledge. Barakallah feekum. Warm applause, Sheikh Ahmed, for the beautiful comments. May Allah reward him. Zakallah khair, Sheikh, for the beautiful comments. Imam Mikayo, it's good to see you again. I know it's our third time see seeing too, you, man. but you're looking different today. Something special? Today is a special day. Today is a special day for Imam Mikayo. Uh, it, was, it was special for my mother. Allah it was her day, right? Allah Akbar. So every, every March 3rd, obviously, she calls me and she says, uh, do you know where you were on this day? I know where I was. And so it's, I was born on March 3rd, right? So she, um, she was the first one to call me this morning, right? And she just said, like, I wanted to be the first one to say, you know, happy birthday to you. And, and I was like, uh, yeah, it was, just, it was just, she's always the first one. I, I forgot. For real. I forgot. I forgot. You know? And um, so, yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, as far as the... I just, no, you're looking, you're looking cool. <laughs> you don't have to justify it. It's all right. Can I, can I ask the question that everyone's wondering? How? 25 or 26? <laughs> 32. 32. <laughs> uh, but you really, like, what you just mentioned really wants me to pivot the topic, though. I mean, like... And I don't like doing this at all. And you guys can completely veto me. Every single one of you guys are all older than me and you know, older, bro older brothers. Some of you, like, very older brothers, you know. <laughs> um, but but I, I really want to speak about what you just mentioned. Your mother, parents, you know, like all of us, 
hopefully, if our parents are if our parents are alive, looking like long, healthy lives, some of most of us are pretty young. We're gonna go back home. To, our parents will be around, inshallah. Our parents have left, and may Allah give them the highest levels of jannah. But are you guys okay with that? Seeing our parents, yeah, yeah, is that okay with you? a little bit? We can touch on it. Is that okay? But like you know, the fact that. You obviously, I don't want to go into your whole story because obviously that's, that's something that you've, you, you know, if you're only if you're comfortable, I know you shared it before as well with us. But your mother reverted recently as well. Yeah. You know, and how was that experience for you as well? Like, because at the end of the day, like, you know, Mikhail said a story once. Like his, he, we, he said that his father's happiest moment as a non Muslim yeah. is when he became a Hafiz. And he was happy because his father was crying. Yeah. And he wasn't even Muslim. Yeah, yeah. You know, and he was cheering him on and he was so proud of him. And that, 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 that story always softens my heart. And then, alhamdulillah, now you're able to take care of your mother. And, you know, she also became a Muslim. How is that process like and how do you feel? Yeah, so. So, bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah. Um, it was about two years ago. And I was in the haram. We were doing umrah. I, it was hajj or umrah, one or the other. And I was with, um, I forget the sheikh's name from, from London. Um, I forget his name, but it's okay, inshallah, it'll come to me. And I was talking to him about my, my mother. And he, he had this very just, you know, strong personality. And he, and he just held my hand right there. We stopped. We were just walking to go sit down. And he just stopped in like one of the corridors of the haram. And he just lifted up his hands, right? And he's just like, oh, Allah, guide her. Oh, Allah, guide her. Oh, it was beautiful. People are walking around, like, what's going on? But whatever, it's haram, who cares? I'm never going to see you again, right? So, <laughs> like, so he's, he's making dua, making dua, making dua. And um, then we put our hands down. And then he's like, do you have your phone on you? And, I, and my, I'm like, oh, no, I know what he's about to say. He's like, call her right now, right? And the time zone's different, all that, you know? Um, and I called her. Now, for me, I've been giving dawah to her for 20 years now. First, in the beginning, very aggressive, and then after that, just very passive, very passive. Um, and it's hard to find that balance. Anyone who, like, no, dealing with family who's not Muslim or even family you're trying to call to the deen, it's like to find that balance is hard. When you go too hard, you push away. When you, and we're always learning and becoming better. So I called, and, and she didn't answer. And low-key, I was kind of, like... Relieved, right? Because I knew he was just about to be like, say the shahada, like just in our praise room. <laughs> so then he's like, don't worry, don't worry. She's going to take her shahada, inshallah. And I, before I tell the rest of it, I remember, because Sheikh Abdul Nasser always says this, towards the end of Abu Talib's life, the Prophet ﷺ just said to him, just say the words for me. I'll take care of the rest. I'll take care of the rest on the day of judgment. Just say the words. So I'm walking, we prayed salah, I'm walking, I'm in the courtyard of Haram of Mecca. And you know how it's very bright, it's very like, it's, it's very bright with the marble and you know. And she FaceTimes back. And I answer it. And like behind me is the scene of, the, of everything. And I could see in that moment she was really, really soft. She was really, and I was just like, you know, mom, can, you know, I talk to you about Islam, does it? Can you just say this, these words for me, the shahada for me? She's like, okay, I'll say it for you. Allah right? Allah you know, I, how much her life changed after that, that, that we'll work on, you know. But she did say the shahada, and, um, and I'm grateful for that, alhamdulillah. So I'm making a lot of dua for my dad now, because he's getting, toward, he's getting older, a lot older now. Um, very spiritual, but not religious, you know. So I'm trying to kind of just like find that way in, you know. And I was reading the story of uh, Abu, uh, Abu Bakhtari, Abu Haytham, Abu Haytham in the Battle of Badr. Abu Haytham bin Utbah bin Rabi'ah. And um, they were burying his father after the Battle of Badr. And the Prophet looked at Abu Hudayfa, تَغَيَّرَ لَوْنُهُ hazinan. His face had changed colors and he was very sad. And the Prophet looked at him and he said, Perhaps you're feeling something right now. And then he said, no, 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 my iman is strong. It's just, he was such a smart man. He was so wise. How did he miss this beauty of this deen? And I was teaching this to the students at Qalam just two days ago, and it just hit me because 
I feel like my dad's such a smart man, but he's just so I guess the lesson from that for all of us is if you're a believer and you have la ilaha illallah, you just got to realize how special you are, how blessed you are, how blessed you are, how blessed you are. And here's what you got to understand. Like he's not, he's not feeling like he knows the path. He's feeling like I don't know where, where this is going. You know what I'm trying to say? He's not ala thiqatin on anything. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, the idea I'm trying to get for us to realize is like, shak is an adab, man. Doubt is an adab in and in itself, you know? So I make dua, I keep trying to talk to him. He likes to talk religion, so it's easier to talk to him, but it just gets very, like, you know, emotional. It's tough, you know? So, you make dua. May Allah give you Father Hidayah as well, Sheikh. I know none of us are, I mean, I, I'm not that, that spiritual Sheikh you met in Medina, neither are we in Medina, we're in Dallas. But, but we will definitely make dua for your father as well. Sheikh Mohsin Najjar. Sheikh Mohsin Najjar. I don't know him, Sheikh. But we're in Dallas and we're going to make dua for your father as well. May Allah give Imam Mikhail's father Hidayah. May Ameen. Allah give him Hidayah very soon. May Allah give him Hidayah Ameen. with ease. Ameen. Uh, and allow Imam Mikhail to be able to walk into Jannah with his entire family, inshallah. Ameen. In the Ameen. Ameen. Moving to Sheikh Naveed. Um, Sheikh, you know, first of all, Sheikh Naveed is, is, is a gem of a person. If you guys haven't seen him before, may Allah, you know, I'm serious, Sheikh. He's a gentle giant, man. May Allah. You, 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 you completely, you're always showing kindness to everyone, you're always soft, you're always so gentle, so much akhlaq that you show everyone, uh, even attendees that come ask you questions, you guys involve them as much as you want, he'll never get tired, inshallah. Um, but, but with all that, Shaykh, you know, you, your, Shaykh Naveed's mother um, transitioned and passed away about two years ago now, Shaykh? No, last year, well, March 15th of 2023. Oh. March 15th of 2023. So, Sheikh, if you have a few minutes, if you don't mind commenting on the importance of serving your mother, not necessarily um, just respecting. Because, you know, I feel like in America, the word respect is so subjective that everyone thinks they're respectful. Everyone thinks they're respectful. The child who's playing PS5 in front of the mother also thinks he's respectful, right? Because the definition of respect is so, is so vague that when you tell someone that you're not respectful, they say, by whose standard? And the best way to create doubt is to make the truth vague. This is why like, the truth has to be clear. And one of the reasons um, why it's important for us to, like the idea of us establishing that this is the standard and everything else is secondary is what allows us to stay, okay, even if we're lacking, we've got to get back over here. You know, but the Islam of Gariba, Sheikh, the idea that of strangers, we talked about this last year as well, that since there is no norm, everyone is a stranger to someone else's definition of what a norm is. Like, there is no norm, right? So everyone is a stranger to someone else's definition of what the norm is. So everyone is respectful to their own definition, but no one else's definition. So not the idea of respect for now, but serving your mother. You served her in her last few moments of her life. You, you literally stopped doing anything else for the most part, and you became her khadim. What was that experience like? What were the lessons you learned from that? And what benefit? What, what can you teach all of us from that experience? How much time can I take, realistically? I need five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ma ba'd. I think in order to understand the ending of her life, you have to understand the beginning and middle as well. So I'm quickly going to try to go through that. Um, the story I'm going to start off with is when I'm about 13 years old. So at 13 years old, I've learned the basics of Islam. I've started studying Islam. Uh, and I have no mentor. I have no guide. I'm just reading books, whatever I can get my hands on. And I remember one of the, the first books that I came across was on the prohibition of music. So I don't know if you guys remember. You, a lot of you may be too young to remember. But Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, right? Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan. Whatever. Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, if you're Pakistani, you better know who he is. You know? So my, my family like, knew his manager and stuff like that. So anytime he would come to Montreal, he would come to our house for dinner. And um, the first time that happened, I was too young to even understand what was going on. The second time he came, I was 13 years old, and I've learned that music is haram. And again, with no teacher, with no mentor, with no guide, 
my natural reaction was, Mom, if he comes into our house and starts singing, I'm going to run away from home. <laughs> and she's like, look, I can't control what he's going to do, but let's just wait and see what happens. Lo and behold, and this was like the crazy thing, this man traveled around with a tabla wherever he went. <laughs> I'm like, who does that? <laughs> so we finish having dinner, and all of a sudden he tells this guy, go bring the tabla from the car. And they start going at it in our house. And I was like, man, this isn't good. And I ran away from home. <laughs> I ran to the masjid. She knew where I was. But the thing is, after everything finished, she's calling the masjid. The masjid's phone line is engaged. It was off the hook. She had an anxiety and panic attack at that time. And she wasn't exactly sure where I was because no one's answering the phone. So after Fajr, I come back home. And she gave me the scolding of my life. Like, where have you been? How could you leave? You know, after the anger had subsided, we had a serious conversation. She said, why did you do that? And I'm like, mom, I love you dearly. And listen to my arrogance here. I'm like, mom, when I get to Jannah, I want you to be there with me. I don't want you to be that in the hellfire. <laughs> and that was like, keeping, keeping in mind, she had a very cultural understanding of Islam and also a very secular upbringing, right? Like, second wave feminism was huge for her. So... That's where her journey to Islam actually begins. And subhanAllah, you know, she superseded me after that. Like, that's where it began, and then she ran miles ahead. Like, I've spoken about this many, many times, subhanAllah. My father, rahimahullah, I cannot remember a single Ramadan except that he spent every single iftar in the masjid, feeding people, serving people. I cannot remember a single Ramadan within the last two decades where my mom did not have multiple khatams of the Qur'an in Ramadan. So that's sort of the person that she became, became. So now, in 2019, what ended up happening was I was doing a lot of consulting work. I was traveling all over the country. I had spoken to my dad the night before. I'm like, hey, is everything okay? Do you want me to come visit? And he's like, no, you know, keep doing what you're doing. I'm really proud of you. And I'm like, you know, Jazakallah Dad. I really, really appreciate that. That means the world to me. No joke, less than 18 hours later, my mom calls and she's like, look, your dad's on his final breaths. You need to come back. So this is the distance between like Montana and New York. That's how far away I am. So I got onto a plane as soon as I could. And by the time that I arrived back in Montreal, you know, rahimahullah, he had passed away. And that struck a chord with me. Like I made an intentional oath with Allah internally, not verbally, but internally. I was like, yo Allah, whatever needs to happen so that I'm there on my mom's final moments, please make that happen. Like I, I can't live this pain twice where I can't be with my parents in their dying moments. So she moves to, to Calgary in 2019 when my dad passed away, rahimahullah. And a few months later, what ends up happening? COVID. And in Canada, COVID was a lot more serious than it was in the United States. We literally had the country shut down for two years, right? So in these two years, I was her driver, I was her chauffeur. I was her interpreter. I was taking her to all of her appointments. I was doing whatever I possibly could. And just as COVID is ending now and things are opening up, you know, her health starts deteriorating at that time. Alhamdulillah, she never caught COVID, but due to old age, her lungs were naturally deteriorating, right? So eventually where she ended up passing away from was basically really, really bad pneumonia. So. I remember that day very, very clearly, subhanAllah. If you go back to the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu before he passes away, he smiles at everyone, and everyone thinks, you know, he's okay now, he's recovered from his sickness. Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala who leaves. And my mom had a similar experience where she was really sick the night before, but the next morning, Allahu Akbar, the fever is gone, the coughing is gone, she's smiling, and she's like, you know, can you grab me some stuff from the store? I was like, no problem, I'll pick it up on my way back from the masjid. And at around 2 o'clock, she calls me up and she's like, Naveed, you got to come right away. And I'm like, is everything okay? And then there's just silence on the phone, and all I hear is her struggling to breathe. So I get there as, soon, as quickly as I possibly could. And, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you from ever being in a, in a situation where you feel completely out of control if you're not relying upon Allah, because that's the dangerous part. Like, we, it's okay to be completely out of control as long as you're relying upon Allah. But it was like one of those brief moments where you know that, oh Allah, I have no one right now for you. I don't know what's happening right now, but I need you to take care of my mother. Like, you know, help me figure this out. 
So her eyes started rolling back behind her head. And she had this thing where she never wanted to go to the hospital. So I was like, I'm really sorry, mom, but I got to call the doctor. I have no idea what's going on right now. Call the ambulance. Ambulance comes. And they're like, look, her oxygen levels are super low. We got to take her in right away. They put her on oxygen right away. And we went to the hospital. And like moment by moment, you can see her getting weaker and weaker. And the beautiful thing is she's making a stighfar the whole entire time. Like, my world is out of control, but she's in control of what's happening with her, subhanAllah. Till we finally get to the hospital, she's on the oxygen, but even with the oxygen, she's, her lungs aren't functioning, and she's, you know, passing away in front of me. So her eyes are opening in and out now, and I'm like, Mom, say your shahada. And she's trying to tell me that I can't even speak anymore. Like, I don't have that capability. But the beautiful thing from our deen, subhanAllah, and this is where... Our deen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, made it so wise that if you're not able to stand in prayer, you can sit in prayer. If you can't articulate the shahada, you can raise your finger. And she passed away, rahimahullah, with her finger raised like this. And she passed away with her shahada, subhanAllah. Now, I, you know, you made me think, where is the silver lining? But I cannot tell you the gratitude I felt. Sorry about that. It's okay. I got it. I cannot express the gratitude that I felt. Jazakallah khair mufti sahab. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed me to be there in the dying moments of, with my mother. Right? To be able to be there in the final moments, to help her with the shahada, to be there for her ghusl, to lead her janazah, to put her in the ground. Like that is the, one of the biggest privileges you will ever get in your life. You know, the Prophet tells us you cannot repay the debt of your parents. That even if you were to find them in slavery and, and free them, you wouldn't have repaid that debt. Right? If you were to carry your mother from Yemen to Mecca, you wouldn't have even repaid, you know, one of the pangs of, 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 of labor that she felt at that time, subhanAllah. So the closest thing I think that we can ever get to is to fulfill their funeral rites, right? And that is just a, a fuddle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why, I, especially the brothers in the room, if you have not learned the basics of how to do the ghusl of the deceased and how to lead the janazah, please do so. I'm telling you, you will regret it at that moment if you're not there to, to wash your own parents and to lead their janazas. You will wish you would have sacrificed everything just to learn that basic fiqh. So learn it now while you can, before they get sick and before these things happen. But all that to say, I think, to get to Mufti's point, there are certain things that they take over your life and you don't realize it. Like my primary identity became my mother's caretaker from 2019 till 2023. When she passed away, no joke, I had an identity crisis. I'm like, who am I now, now that my mother is no longer here? So all of that to say, you know, there's a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions himself and then our parents. Because while the level of debt of gratitude to Allah is infinite, the closest thing to that debt of infinity is due to our parents. The sacrifices that they've made to us being born, to us being, you know, fed and clothed and educated and given the tarbiyah that we were given. Like, how do you repay that, subhanAllah? And that's a debt that should always be um, on our mind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us tawfiq and understanding. Ameen. Ameen. khair, Shaykh, for sharing that. May Allah bless you, may Allah reward you for the years that you served your mother. Um, you know, people... People say that I'm too busy to serve my parents, too busy to serve my mother. Um, but you just showed us that once you experience that, it's literally everything for you in this world. And I know I'm the wrong person to speak about this, but it would be a shame that our parents are alive in this world and we're unable to serve them at some capacity. And Sheikh, you served them for three, three years straight. Um, I, I think something else, Sheikh, is like sometimes they call us or message us and we don't have the enthusiasm that they have to want to talk to us because we have so much going on. And they just want to say, hi, how are you? Allah forgive us. And once they're gone, Sheikh, you have no idea what I would sacrifice just to have her message and say hi again or to call and say hi again. I would give up everything that I have to be able to have that moment again. But the golden lining here, and I think for those of us that have lost parents or loved ones, is 
there's a reason why we believe in Jannah, right? Because after the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next most beautiful meeting is going to be with our loved ones that are waiting for us as we enter into Jannah. And that's what we look forward to now. <clears throat> so, Shaykh Ahmed, um, if, like, in regards to parents, you spoke about the mother. I mean, I think there's a lot to be said about the idea of your mother being proud of you. Like, you know, I, I, I find this to be very interesting. We're, we're, we're five brothers. You know, people have friends. You guys have, you know, like, we have, like, people that we're, we're born and raised with and so on. For some reason, we would want to do anything to make our friend proud of us. Like, yo, I'll do anything to make you happy with me, man. I'll go anywhere for you. And in the moment a person gets married, I'll do anything to make you happy with me, with your spouse. For some reason, it always seems in that entire conversation, it doesn't truly become a, an intended goal to make your mother proud of you and to make your parents proud of you. It's almost accidental because, oh, they're proud of me. That's great. Mashallah, they're happy with me because they're always happy with us. My brother, rahimullah, when he left this world, when he transitioned, and I mean, the hardest part of it was, how are we going to tell our mother? And there's like, you can't learn how to tell someone um, that their son, you know, became shaheed. And we decided, you know, okay, we'll go together. And may Allah bless Sheikh Abdullah and Sheikh Abdul Aziz, and from Mufti Rahman as well. But um, especially the, my two older brothers, MashaAllah, has given them a lot of strength and they're, they're pretty strong, you know, strong and heavy duty. Me and Mufti Rahman are like babies uh, in comparison to them in that aspect. Um, they said, okay, let's go. We get into our house and when we tell our mother, of course, she already had intuition. I mean, mothers are mothers. After saying, The first thing she said, Sheikh, was, Allah, aap meri gawah, aap meri gawah, aap, aap meri hai, ki se aap bhi razi ho Like, in, in English, which means, Oh Allah, you become my witness that I was indeed pleased with this kid and I was proud of him, so you better be proud of him too. And she said in Urdu, she said in Urdu three times, she said in Punjabi, she said, Allah, you better be proud of him. Because I was proud of him. I'm proud of him. I'm proud of him being my son. And when Sheikh Abdullah told my father, it was literally the identical response. That, oh Allah, I mean, I'm proud to be the father of this son and I'm, fa I'm proud to be the father of this shaheed. Like, how many of us youngsters can say, and at that moment, all of his brothers came to a conclusion, there's a reason why Allah took him first. Because if any of us left, we wouldn't have gotten that response. <laughs> you know, it's like, we definitely wouldn't have gotten it. But every one of us concluded that that is the ultimate goal now. After making Allah proud is, yo, I want to leave this world if I leave first. That my mom is actually proud of me. Like she's happy with me. Why is that not a goal for us? Why is that not an intended objective of our life that we wish to make our parents proud of us? Because the moment they're proud of us, the pleasure of Allah is found in the pleasure of the parents. Like if my father and mother are unhappy with me, there is no sheikh in the world that can intercede for us to get us Jannah. Because the, the, the doorway to Jannah is the mother. And the gatekeeper of Jannah is the father. So how would anyone else be able to support us? So the idea I want to ask you, Sheikh, is how can that become a goal? Why is that important to be a goal? That if we leave first, and, and you know what? Sheikh Abdul Rahman, he said something very interesting. He said, in so many ways, being a son or a daughter and leaving first and having your mother breaking dua for you, that's a guaranteed Jannah. Because whatever a parent makes dua for is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine having a mother making dua for her son who's already passed away. Psh, that guy's chilling. Right? But she has to be proud. Sheikh. 
before, before I answer uh, Sheikh's question, I want to share a quick story. Many years ago, uh, when I was studying in Medina, uh, you know, every few weeks, me and my friends, whenever we'd get a chance, we'd, you know, gather together at the end of the school week and go for Umrah. On one specific week, a few of us, we had decided we were going for Umrah. A few of us friends, and one of the brothers was a convert. Uh, and it came, I think the end of the week was like Thursday or Wednesday, whatever it may have been. And, you know, school had finished right after Dhuhr. We had packed our bags and we were heading. And I got a message from the brother who was a convert. And he said, uh, Ahmad, uh, I'm not going to be able to make it. And I was shocked. I was like, like, you were in, like you're going, what happened? So on my way out, you know, I, I went to his dorm room. I visited him. I, I wanted to make sure everything was okay. And... When he opened the door, I could tell immediately before he said anything, there was this, like this sadness that overcame him. And I said, is everything okay? He said, yeah, everything is okay. He said, I just, I just can't go. And you know, I felt like he didn't want to talk about it in that moment, so I kind of left it. I said, but everything's okay. He said, everything's okay. So you know, those of us that were going, we left. And on my way uh, to Umrah, as we were like about halfway between Medina and Mecca, he messaged me and he said, make dua, my parents accept Islam. And I knew when he sent that text message, that was his pain in that moment. That's, he was feeling that pain. That what if my parents don't die upon Islam? SubhanAllah, it was such an important reminder for me that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us and we're so grateful for Allah subhanahu, we're so grateful to Allah for that. But also being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's guided our parents. You know. Uh, Sheikh Mikail was sharing the story of his parents. And as he was speaking, Wallahi, I, I felt his pain. Because you could feel that it was genuine, it was sincere. So I and everyone in here, we make dua for Sheikh Mikail's father. And for anyone in here whose parents, both parents, one parent, their mother, their father, is not Muslim, we, all, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala collectively to guide our parents to Islam and to give them steadfast upon this religion. Because wallahi, as Sheikh Naveed was talking, and he was talking about, you know, that what you felt of your mother, rahmatullah alayha, passing away, and you had that ability to, to pray upon her and fulfill those funeral rites, not that you're completely repaying everything that she's done for you, but that tranquility and sakina that it gives you and that peace that it gives you that you have the ability to do that. And those of us that both of our parents or, or both of our parents have accepted Islam or at least one of them, subhanAllah, we should take pride in that. We should thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just for our guidance, but for their guidance. As for uh, the question uh, that uh, Mufti Abdul Wahab so beautifully put, you know, in my own experience, in my own experience, subhanAllah, as I have gotten older and hopefully a little bit wiser, you begin to realize the value and the status of your parents. And you can read the narrations again and again as a teenager, right? But subhanAllah, as you grow older, and then as you have your own kids, once you have your own kids, the way you think it, it's it just completely different. Is just completely different. I remember uh, a few winters ago, it was like my first Umrah post COVID. And we were in Medina, myself and Ustad Abdurrahman Murphy. And we were in the Rawda. We had gotten into the Rawda. You had to make an appointment. And you get into the Rawda, there's a little shot clock. Mm -hmm. Had 10 minutes, right? And subhanAllah, they had never had that before. And at first, you're like, man, that's annoying. But Subhanallah, that 10 minutes, it put, it put your life in perspective. Because you're there, you're like, I have 10 minutes right now. What if this 10 minutes separated between me and my final destination, whether it be paradise or the hellfire? And Subhanallah, I found myself sitting there and I thought about all the people that, I, that asked me to make dua for them. And every person I came across was like, he can wait, she can wait. He can wait, ah, ah. But then it was like my loved ones, my parents, my spouse, and my children. My parents, my spouse, and my children.
my parents, my spouse. And it kept playing again and again. And wallahi, when that last minute hit, when that last minute hit, I'll be honest, it was all about my children. That was all I cared about. We walked out of the rawda, and I looked at Ustad Abdul Rahman, and he looked back at me, and I said, hey, that last minute, he said, my kids, my kids. And I was like, subhanAllah, that's, that's what I was feeling. And then the thought crosses my mind, that subhanAllah, what if my parents were in that position? I hope, I hope, that they feel the same way towards me that I feel towards my children. But what have I done in my 30 odd some years to earn their pleasure? And subhanAllah, it, it really put things into perspective. I know many of us or a number of us have difficulties with our parents, right? It, it's normal, it's a situation in life, you know? My mother, Hafizahullah, may Allah bless her and protect her and increase her, you know? I love her, but she, she goes hard on me. She goes hard on me. A few years ago, a few years ago when I came back from Medina, it's like my second year, I was driving, and call, she called me, and it was like a Saturday. Saturday is completely off, you know? No sessions, nothing, nothing. It's like, do you pray for Ajahn in the masjid? I was like, mom, I'm 30, you can't ask that. She's like, I can always ask that, I'm your mom. It's like, God. It's like, how do you respond to that? <laughs> Or like just, just a month ago, she called me and she was, you know, she was talking about so many different things, changing subjects, no transition sentences, just changing <laughs> subjects, mashallah, right? And then I'm driving, I'm listening, and all of a sudden the conversation becomes, Ahmed, you know, like, this is honest, I'm going to expose myself right now. It's like, Ahmed, like, you know, you, you've put on some weight, you could lose some weight. <laughs> and I was so like emotionally hurt. <laughs> I was like, I've been trying to get in shape recently, actually. <laughs> and she was verbally abusing me. <laughs> and I was Emotional like, damage. <laughs> and I was like, take it. Take it. <laughs> I was like, take it. I was like, mom, you're right. Mom, you're right. And it hurt. Wallahi, it hurt. Wallahi, because I've been putting work in. <laughs> and she, I was like, mom, you're right. Mom, you're right. And I was like, subhanAllah, I know 10, 15 years ago, I'd over-respond. Like, what are you, what, mom, what are you talking about? I'm in shape, right? But I was like, no, I just want her to be pleased with me. I want her to be pleased with me. I got home, my, mom, my, my wife was like, I was talking to my wife, I was like, yeah, I talked to mom. She's like, oh, you talked to mom today? She says, what, we, what was she saying? I was like, she was fat shaming me. <laughs> she said, what? She said, what did you say? I said, nothing. I say, you're right, mom. You're right. But, you know, I, I've, said to, I've said to young people before that if you die with all the wealth and all the possessions, but you die with not an ounce of iman in your heart, you have nothing. But if you die with nothing, if you die with absolutely nothing, and you die with an ounce of iman, and in addition to that, your parents are pleased with you. You have attained the greatest form of success. There is no greater success than that. That you die with la ilaha illallah. And Allah is pleased with you. And your parents are pleased with you. Then you've won. Ask yourself. Ask yourself. What is the last time you called your mother or your father and you said, I love you? I'll, I'll end on this. I gave a khutbah like months ago. It was about like how to, it was reminding everyone that, you know, the, there's relationships that Allah has given us in our life of our loved ones. And each one of those loved ones, they're holding an hourglass. The sand is constantly falling. We don't know how much sand is left for each one of them. And I was reminding people, say to your loved ones, I love you. What's the last time you did it? I finished the khutbah. I got in my car and my mom called me. I was like, she didn't call me really, usually right after Jummah. I said, Salaam alaikum. She said, Wa alaikum as salam. She said, I just, want, I just called you to say I love you. I watched your khutbah. 
you know what a fool I felt like? I was like, wow. I was so busy telling the people. And my mom, subhanAllah, right after the Jummah khutbah, she called me. She says, I just called you to say I love you. So, so uh, can I segue? Go, go ahead, yeah. Everyone take out your phone. Take it out. Everyone take out your phone. If you've been at one of my workshops, you've seen me do this for work. Sheikh Muntasir, you too. We got Sheikh Muntasir in the house. Everyone take out your phone, okay? And uh, open up your, um, your, your text messages. Now, um, I'm, you're going to type this, okay? Get ready. It's going to take seconds. You're going to say, mommy, mom, daddy, close brother or sister, someone close to you. Someone close to you, whoever is close, because that's what we want to, we want to build those relationships. And you're going to text them, and you're going to say, it could be your wife if she's not here, or husband if he's not here. Everyone, I want to see everyone texting someone, okay? Muntas, are you on this, Sheikh? Nah. Okay, we're going to say, whatever their name, blank, I'm just texting to say, you crossed my mind, and I'm thinking about you, and I love you. I love you. And then, quotations, Yes, I'm okay. <laughs> no one has stolen my phone. <laughs> no one has stolen my phone. Okay, S Sister Zeba, you're doing it? Good, excellent. All right, and everyone, we're going to send it now. If they're watching, so what? It's okay. Saying I love you doesn't diminish the more you say it. It doesn't lose its value the more you say, I love you. Did everyone send it now? Everyone sent it? Bismillah. Look how quick that was. Here's the deal. The same way we talk about dhikrullah, where you get this constant connection with Allah by regularly, frequently doing dhikr, the same way as we build relationships with people close to us and that we want to get close to us. Now listen, if that message was awkward, let's be real. Let's, we, we're all being super transparent today, like crazy, crazy. Uh, how many people, the one you sent it to, it was a awkward, it, was, it, it would be awkward to say it to this person regularly, right? Raise high, high, because we need moral support. Okay, okay, cool. All right, so this is what you're going to do. How many of you who raised your hands want that awkwardness? Who'd you message, by the way? I'm doing now. I felt bad. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. From those, listen, from those who raised their hand, how many of y'all would like that awkwardness to be removed? You don't want that awkwardness between you and that person just to say, I love you. Okay, good. This is what we're going to do now. Tomorrow, around the same time, put an alarm right now. You're going to send, don't copy paste the message, but a similar one. Okay, put an alarm to remind. Send message of love to blank. Okay, quick. It has to be short. It can only take you 15 seconds because if it takes long, the nafs and shaitan will stop you from doing it. Okay? And it has to be brief. It has to be a brief message of love. Okay? If you do it for about, if you do it for about a week or two weeks, the, the person will actually start missing it if you don't do it. And the awkwardness is gone. So, so practice this in order that you build that familiarity and that ability to say I love you. And if you want to get better, because here's the problem. Text messaging makes it hard for us to say things face to face. So if you want to level up, leave a voice note. Voice notes are awesome because you don't have the awkwardness of hearing the silence in between and all that. So leave a voice note. Say, hey, mom, dad, just thinking about you. Want to say I love you. Um, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Just thinking about you. Love you. Bye. Okay. Muntasir, so did you send yours? Sheikhna. <laughs> did you send it? You done? Did you get a response yet? They're sleeping. How many people got a response already? Can, can we hear some of the responses? Yes, brother. What was the response? Oh. His mother said LOL. Okay. Okay, listen though, listen. I'm telling you she's smiling in her heart. She's at home feeling so good. Tomorrow if you do it again, watch what happens, okay? Yes, brother, what was the response you got? You raised your hand in the white shirt? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Anyone get a funny response? Yes? Is that 
hard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, mashallah. Yes, yes, brother. Yes. Oh, don't go do group chat. Okay, it's okay. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. Put me on your will. Put me on your will. Okay, listen. He said he texted the group chat. Here's my recommendation. It loses effectiveness. It loses effectiveness. This is good. I'm happy you did it because we're all learning from that moment. It loses a bit of the effectiveness. My recommendation is that we... Uh, my recommendation is that we... Uh, I'm sorry, I say Muhammad. Sorry. We individually message. Because by individually messaging, what that does is it shows I'm thinking about you, that one person, and we're able to establish that connection, okay? And another thing, some of us feel that the person that we want to connect to, we've, there's something between us. If the person is still breathing and is alive, you always have a chance to renew that. It's never over. You can always renew that. You can always make that connection. So, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, every day, every day, send that message. Inshallah. I love you, Mashaikh, for the beautiful um, statements and the piece of advice, the, the, the real life scenarios. I mean, like, I think just because we have maybe 10, 15 minutes left, maybe we can share some stories from the Sahabas as well. Like, Sahabas are people who were real life people, they were not fictional characters. They had real life challenges. They had real life issues. There was a youngster, and I'll share one story. And if the Mashaikh, you know, if you guys feel comfortable sharing different stories or commenting on this one, that would be great. There was a young man who, who was earning a lot of money. And some of us start feeling that way. Like, oh, I'm earning a lot of money now. You know, my parents are living with me. Like, bro, what? Like, parents are living with me. Like, what do you mean parents are living with you? That verbiage is so wrong. You're living with your parents, even if it's your house. Because your parents brought you to this world. We live in a culture where people say that it's cultural to stand up for your parents. It's not really Islamic. If any culture in this world has a fabric of disrespect, we should never allow that culture to enter into our homes. And that is 90% of the culture of America. It's filled with industry. It has, everything is based on merit. It's not based on the virtue of who the person is. It's about what accolades they have. What, do they, what titles do they hold? My father doesn't hold a title. My mother doesn't hold a title. I'm a manager of this company. My parents were just doing this. I'm this. This youngster was experiencing this. And his father was living with him. Taking from him. The, kid, the young man, who's a sahaba, turns up to the Prophet one day and he complains about his father. Look, he complained about his father to the purest heart in this world, the Prophet There's not a more pure person in the world than the Prophet of Allah. We complain about our parents to our friends. Why? They can help us. Neither do they need to know about those different challenges unless they're really going to give you good advice. Like, why would we complain about our parents to our spouse? Even I, I, feel, I find it to be almost disrespectful to my, to my mother or father if I'm venting about my parents to my own spouse. That's my mom or my dad. If I want to speak to someone, I'll speak to them. We speak in public, and my dad's like this. Tallahi inna kalafi dalali kal qadim. How they said to Yaqub alayhi salam, you're old man, you don't know what's going on anymore. You backwards. So this man complains to the Prophet about my father taking my money. Eating my food, taking my time, taking my space, my privacy. We're all about our privacy in America except for those who. We're all about privacy with those who we don't need to be private in front of. Who we don't need to be private in front of. And we're all open in regards to those who we should be private in front of. We want privacy, but everything's on Instagram. But keep my door closed. Don't come in my, house. Don't come in my door. The dichotomy in the definition of privacy has changed. What type of privacy do you want? You just simply, we just simply don't want our people who truly love us to be near us. Then we're left all alone. So he does the same thing. And the father 
when he, the Prophet sends a Sahaba to call the father, because you have to hear both sides of the story. When imagine, like, ah, this story kills me, man. Imagine the father, as he's coming to the Prophet, he finds out that his son complained about him to the Prophet of Allah. Like, what he's experiencing that my, son, my father takes my food. And this father's heart is broken, and he recites a couplet in his brain. Small poem in his brain, in his head, in his mind, in his heart. The moment he enters into the, into the gathering of the Prophet, the Prophet looks at him and he says, Oh father, before I ask you anything, you must tell me the couplet that you were reading in your head. Read it to me. And the man says, Every time I meet you, I am, I am once again convinced that you're the Prophet of Allah. How do you know that I read a couplet in my head? He says, Jibreel came down from the heavens. The father's heart was broken, Jibreel descended. Father's heart was broken, Jibreel descended. Not Yusuf being thrown in a well, Jibreel descended. Ibrahim being thrown into a fire, alayhi salam, Jibreel descended. Father's heart was broken, Jibreel came down, alayhi salam. He said, oh Muhammad salam, he told me to ask you what that poem was because all of us angels are excited to hear it. We're waiting. And the father recited, غَدَوْتُكَ مَوْلُودًا وَمُنْتُكَ يَا فِعَةً تَعُلُّ بِمَا أَجْنِي عَلَيْكَ وَتُنْهَلُ إِذَا لَيْلَةً ضَاقَتْكَ بِالسَّقْمِ لَمْ أَبِتْ لِسَقْمِكَ إِلَّا سَأْهِرًا أَتَمَا الْمَلُو Man, like, this poem is, is hard. Right? He says, غَدَوْتُكَ مَوْلُودًا وَمُنْتُكَ يَا فِعَةً like I, like I lived my whole life to raise you when you were a baby. The happiest day of my life was when you came into this world. Like that was the happiest day of my life. When you would get sick, it was as if I was sick. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't enjoy my work. I couldn't enjoy my day. When you finally reached the age that I was looking forward to, I was waiting for that day when you graduate, get your first job. Get your first check, get your first car, get married, buy your first house. Like all of those things that we as children are looking forward to, wallahi, there's no one looking forward to it more than our parents. They're looking forward to it. You responded with such harshness, such sternness, as if this entire time you were the one doing me a favor. Entire time you're doing me a favor And I have done nothing for you He says at the end of it If you can't treat me like your father At least treat me like a good neighbor should be treated I'm telling you May Allah protect me, protect all of us Some of our parents Feel like strangers in our home They feel like strangers to us They're walking on eggshells Because of the way we speak to them they're walking on eggshells because they're afraid that if they say too much, we're 24 years old, we'll buy our own house. They're walking on eggshells because if we say too much, you might get food from somewhere else and say, you know what, I don't need you, mom, anymore. They're walking on eggshells. How in the world should my mother or father ever had to think twice about what they wish to say to me? It doesn't have to be whatever it is. Like, we don't have to become, we, we should never use principles and nuances upon our parents. Use it upon everyone else. Have a heart and that's it. That's all you need with your parents. And at the end of it, Prophet of Allah's beard was full of tears. And he grabs, you know, Mikhail explained this so well. He grabs his son. He says, Anta wa maluka li abik. You kid, you, your entire life, your existence, your money, every single thing you are and you own belong to your father. Who do you think you are? Imam Mikhail, you comment on this and you say... Let me, yeah, this is, this is a beautiful segue because no scholars take a fiqh approach to this part. Meaning, there is no fiqh madhab that says, you know, that a, a father could just come and take everything away. Right? The jumhur, they say, no, what's happening in this hadith is the Prophet ﷺ is getting this boy to recognize what he owes his father. Now, I also want to mention something. 
we also live in very, we also live in a time where you may not have the ideal relationship, but Islam wants you still to do, fulfill the haq of the person. What do I mean by this? When we listen to the story of Mufti's mother, parents, if we listen to the story of Sheikh's parents, sometimes in this room there's some of us that are like, like low key, my parents are mad abusive, like legit abusive. And I think we need to recognize something. Islam never condones abuse, never condones. And parents need to be careful not to weaponize the, the deans giving them so much respect. You should not be using that as a weapon uh, for, the, for, for something that's not the well-being of your child. But here's the thing I, I think we need to focus on. So dhulm is never okay. Oppression is never okay. Financial, when you said walking on eggshells, that hit me. Because we live, we live, right? So you say. No, no, no. Um, that's real, bro. Older parents living with their adult children, walking on eggshells, that's real, man. Where you become like the parent almost. You become like the parent. Sheikh, now, Jazakallah khair. Do we have another chair? We need another Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. <laughs> um, Mufti Muntasir, if you can join us in short. Oh, Sheikh, we're not, just please don't. Just so, so the point we're making, Sheikh, now, and perhaps you can comment on this. We've been having a very emotional conversation. Just, just come, please, Sheikh, I'll be happy. Who is it? Who is it? Mashallah. Sheikh Muntasir, please, yes. I mean, mashallah. This is Sheikh Muntasir Zaman. He's a faculty at Qalam. His book is for sale. He's a, a mashallah, a brilliant academic in our community, mashallah, representing the East Coast, alhamdulillah. So, uh, Sheikh Yasser, assalamu alaikum, it's good to see you. We've been having a beautiful, uh, emotional conversation about the hukuk of our parents. Sheikh Naveed shared the beautiful story of his mother passing. We spoke about you know, my mother saying her shahada and my father, father still struggling to try to find hidayah. We spoke about <laughs> Sheikh Ahmed's mom roasting him that he needs to uh, lose some weight. <laughs> and we all even sent messages of love. And it dawned on me that we kind of need to also balance the idea that not everyone is dealing with perfect parents. They, they may have done something wrong. They may have you've gone through some difficult things. And Shaykh, I was just explaining that despite the fact, satara atharatan alaykum, the Prophet ﷺ said, you will see sometimes your rights aren't given to you, but that doesn't mean that you ever stop giving the rights to the other person because my fulfilling the rights of my wife, my children is not a quid pro quo. This is me with Allah. I'm doing this because this is what, between me and Allah, not between me and you. So whether you fulfill my haq, Cool, I'm gonna, I understand there's toxicity in some people, we need to create boundaries, all that. But my fulfilling of rights to my spouse, my fulfilling of rights to my family and everyone around me is about me doing what's right with God, with Allah. They will be questioned about their negligence and you'll be questioned about your negligence as well. So this is what we were discussing. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala ma ba'd. Apologies about the uh, delay. I don't know if you were told, but the flight was delayed three times. I left house at 5 a.m., went to Orlando, stayed there for a conference, gave my talk, met with the brothers, sisters, went to the airport, and standard travel stuff. So, but Sheikh, you still look chikna chikna. <laughs> I think he still looks cute. I'm, I'm, literally, literally, I'm, <laughs> I'm literally landing from the airport and driving here, alhamdulillah, on the way home. Um, khair. Wallahi I literally walked in and you, 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 you brought up the topic that I've been thinking about much of today. Mm -hmm. And these are very awkward topics because a lot of, we're human beings also, you know, we also deal with the same things you guys deal with and there's a lot going on in, in our households as well. Um, these are personal topics. I literally walk in. This is probably not the best time for me to talk because I'm not as rational as I typically am. Not that I'm very rational otherwise, but 
I'm walking off the plane after a long day, and I probably say things that I'm going to regret. So, okay, Mufti Saab, if you can delete the recordings yeah, we'll delete, and we'll you know, just not yeah. not uh, put this online. And may Allah protect all of us from any type of harm and, and, and give us purity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be raw here because it has been troubling me all of today. Alhamdulillah, today was my father's 88th birthday. We don't celebrate birthdays, as you probably are. Not that I think it's wrong, just that his culture. So I wasn't at home doing anything special, but today is his 88th birthday. And alhamdulillah, he moved in with me three and a half, four years ago because he wasn't able to live on his own. And for the first time in my life, I'm the caretaker, right? And nobody prepares you to take care of your parents. No book can tell you how to be in charge of those who are in charge of you once upon a time. You're not prepared to have frank conversations with those who taught you how to speak. As I said, this isn't the right time for me to talk about this because there's a lot going on, you know. And, okay. and you know, um, my parents are now at a stage, you know, 88 and my mom's 80, where, as Allah says in the Quran, that that cyclical life that Allah created and you see it the frailty of an 88 year old who can hardly stand and he's the one who used to throw you up and pick you up as a child and the difficulty in the intellect, as Allah says in the Quran, وَمَن نُعْمِرْهُ نُنَكِّسْهُ فِي الْخَلْقِ Right? And at this stage, and everybody knows this is not something private, but khair, I don't want you to publicize this on other, but my, my, my father has dementia at this stage, right? And to be able to, you know, uh, overcome that at this stage, my father is the founder of the MSA in Texas. He's the founder of the ISGH, 1960-something, right? My memories of him as a child, dynamic, active. You know, my speaking skills, I learned from him, right? He was a speaker. And to now see him not able to form a basic sentence is crumbling, really. You know, so, you know, it's... Um, like I said, nobody prepares you to become an adult. It's not, it's not easy becoming an adult, you know? And uh, you just have to take it, you know, one stage at a time. And, and you know, the thing is, you know you're not doing what you're supposed to do, right? And you know a time is going to come when you're going to regret that you didn't do more. But right now, life comes to you, right? I got to travel, I got to give that, I got to do this and that. You know, may Allah forgive, you know, I don't know. How do you, how do you balance? How do you balance? Because... We can never do justice, you know. We can never do justice. And the rights that they have over us can, cannot be repaid. But we just have to try whatever we can do. And, and there's a verse in the Quran that gives me consolation. And SubhanAllah, you know, living life teaches you about the reality of the Quran that you never understand reading dozens of tafsir. There's a verse that Allah talks about the rights of the parents. Wallahi, I never understood it until I had to take care of the parents myself, right? You all know the verse. We hear it all the time in the khutbahs and durus. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Right? This is all of you, you know this. Now, what's the very next verse? What's the very next verse? I never thought of that verse until I had to deal with my parents. It's really difficult dealing with becoming the boss of those who are your bosses for 30, 40 years of your life, right? 
I'm never going to forget till the day I die the conversation I had to have with my father when I had to pull his car keys away that he's not allowed to drive, oh. right? Oh my God. Can you imagine now you have to put restrictions on your own father, the one who taught me how to drive and got me my first car. <laughs> and Allah says in the Quran, رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ إِن تَكُونُوا صَالِحِينَ فَإِنَّهُ كَانَ لِلْأَوَابِينَ غَفُورًا The level of optimism this verse gives, right? It's so powerful when you're living this experience. Because Allah knows you're going to have to, you have to be harsh because out of love. Just like they were harsh with you out of love. And as, as a teenager, you don't understand it until you hit your 30s. Well, when you hit your 40s and 50s, the, the table turns completely, right? And you have to be harsh upon them out of love. And you have to put restrictions on them, not because you're trying to be, on the contrary, it's the most difficult thing in the world, and Allah gives you leeway. رَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي نُفُوسِكُمْ Allah knows why you're doing this. Allah knows your intention. إِن تَكُونُوا صَالِحِينَ If you're doing it out of sunah and piety, you want to help them, then don't worry. Just turn back to Allah, Allah is going to forgive you. You can't live up to that reality and expectation. But you try to do whatever you can. And I think most of us on, the, on this podium are older than most of you. Some of you are older than us. But I keep on saying, age teaches you what books will never teach you. And experiences teach you what scholars are not going to teach you in madrasa. So even hearing it from people, look to me right now, not as a sheikh figure, but simply as an older brother who's gone through things that maybe some of you are going to go through soon. And all I can say is, if you're still at that phase where you feel like your parents are being a little bit too strict or harsh on you, maybe they are. But a time will come when the role will be reversed. Maybe they are, but a time will come when you will be in charge of them. And I also realize if that time comes, thank Allah, because there are many who never get that time. And if that time comes, appreciate that you have something. I, I acknowledge this as well. But I'm telling you from now that time is going to be some of the most difficult things you have to do in your whole life. Really. Nobody has prepared you for that. To, to manage, to balance. And again, another ayah comes to mind. Again, the Quran is so profound and powerful, right? That when Allah talks about mirath and Allah talks about inheritance, what does Allah say about children, ancestors and descendants, right? What does Allah say about ascendants and descendants? Right? How can you decide between your father and your son? How can you decide between your mother and your daughter? And everybody who has a daughter knows that, that space, special place the daughter has, right? But then mother has another special place. And Allah says, how are you going to decide between this? That's why I took charge. Don't worry about it. I took charge of inheritance. You don't have to worry about fractions. Literally. That's exactly what, uh, literally smack in the middle, right? Of all of these fractions, there's this weird, I shouldn't say weird, but there's this interpolation, right? There's this interpolation that doesn't seem to make sense. But it makes complete sense once you're in that position. Can you imagine if you had to write a will at this stage of your life? At my stage, right? At where, what, what are you going to do? If I do go, who, how much? How, what are we going to do at this stage? And Allah says, These fractions are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In any case, I, I wasn't prepared. And I do ask if you don't um, put any of this online. I'm literally walking into this, inshallah. Bismillah. First of all, Sheikh, Sheikh, um, Traveled and came straight here. I, I, I texted him. You know when you're asking me to text one person, um, I actually texted Sheikh Yas. I said, "Where are you?" <laughs> I said, "Are you still coming?" And then, um, then I texted someone. I said, "Sheikh Sheikh Navid texted me, so I texted Sheikh Navid back because I love Sheikh Navid." Um, but um, in, in love, bless you, Sheikh. You still came and rewards you. And I think it was essential. We benefited so much from the few moments you just shared. I'm we'll come back to you, Sheikh Yasser, in one minute. Uh, Mufti, Muntasar, Munt, Mufti Muntasar, you just joined. Um, Salam wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing well. And you just came from the most beautiful state in the country, Michigan. Hope it went well. 
I hope that came yeah. back quick. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's true. I hope. Oh. I told Sheikh I'm just going to do him a favor and hold the mic. I didn't know how to use it. <laughs> no, no, Habibuna. Uh, you know, you, 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 were, you were sitting for some time, you were listening, and now you just joined here with Sheikh Yasser. said, any comment, any advice, anything that you wish to share uh, will benefit, inshallah. You know, and, so no, I, if you don't mind, sorry to cut you off. Sorry. But, you know, Ufsab, what if I do? You know, I'll tell you right now. I'm, I'm going to get to you. Hachi Mufti al Wahab, I have a setup for him, a good one. So, I know your book just came out on Imam al Bukhari, Rahimullah. Yeah. And Imam al-Bukhari's parents, Rahimahullah, had a huge impact on his life. So I think that would be a natural segue to talk about your book, but more importantly about the parents of Imam al-Bukhari and the impact that they had on, on his life. It just seems a little conflict of interest talking about that particular incident, but... But, and really, uh, I, 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 you can, that too, but I really like... Some, we all went, traveled, left our home for at least 12 years. T far away from our parents, away from our mother, away from our father, at a time where... I mean, they loved us. They still love us. And we came back from boarding school home, and we landed, and we were gone. Mm -hmm. Serving, running around, doing whatever we think is beneficial. Share whatever your experience is about that. Like, how, how, how do you feel after going for all those years, coming back, the experience of being in this, away from them for so long and coming back? What are your thoughts about that, and what do you feel like in regards to... Your responsibility, but at the same time, how much they gave up to let you become a scholar. Like one, some, one two, a, a group of parents had to lose their child for 12 years to make a Mufti Muntasir. What was that like? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al anbiya wal Mursaleen. Hopefully it won't be a Jumu'ah khutbah, I'm just uh, starting with hamd wal salah. Um, you know, when I was listening to Shaykh talk about his conversations with his mother, it reminded me of a conversation I had with my mother once. And um, when you're studying in madrasa, usually there's a policy you're not allowed to grow your hair. So the moment you graduate, the first thing you want to do is break all those rules that you weren't able to really uh, practice on. So I started growing my hair one day. And my mother, I come home after salah, you know, leading taraweeh, everybody's praising you, everybody's putting you in a pedestal that, you know, only Allah knows best. Falatu zakku anfusakum. And subhanAllah, my mom's like, you know, tomorrow I want to make sure that you come bald, you look like a thug. <laughs> and I said, wow, that was the kindest thing I've heard in a while, but alhamdulillah. So the next day I go, I shave my head, and I come back bald, and my mom's like, you look like a prisoner, what happened? I said, what do you want me to do? <laughs> but subhanAllah, you know, at that point I realized, you know, one day I was having a conversation with my mother, and, um, you know, sometimes things get a little heated, right? And uh, we're having this conversation, and she's like, I told you to do this, and I'm like, I did this. I said, and the biggest mistake I made, I said, Mom, you know the fatwa on the subject? She said, wait, 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 wait. Stop right there. In this house, I'm the mufti, and you're the student. And I said, subhanAllah, you know, she's so right about that, right? I said, all knowledge, all ilm to the side, Respect comes before everything else. And subhanAllah, I think back on, to answer your question, how indebted we are to our parents. Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala, who's the composer of the Muatta, the most influential collection of hadith, when he was a young child, his mother would do his tashir, take him to the classes, put the turban around his head, and was the motivating factor for who he became. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullahu ta'ala, he lost his father early on. His mother was the one supporting him in every single step. And at times, whatever profession we're in, whether it's religious, whether it's mundane, whether it's professional, to forget about the sacrifices of those who invested in us when we were vulnerable, and to forget them when they're vulnerable is literally the epitome of selflessness, selfishness. It's the epitome of selfishness. And, you know, after listening to Sheikh Yasser talk, it's really hard to add anything to that. So I'll just conclude my session with saying, you know, subhanAllah, the one thing I've learned with my interactions with my parents and seeing and observing my teachers interact with their parents, it's less about being right for the sake of being right, and it's more about fulfilling your obligations to them before 
you're remorseful and you regret not enjoying those moments. I'm going to end on this. My teacher, subhanAllah, he used to always cry. Literally in class, he used to cry. And randomly, we're studying a subject such as purification, tahara, our psalm. And he would randomly cry. And one day we mustered the courage to ask him, like, Shaykh, you know, it seems a little abrupt. And he said, every time I think about the fact that I can't call my mother and get a resp response back from her, just breaks my heart. And I think about that all the time. And I hope and I pray Allah mends our relationships with our parents and allows us to muster the courage to swallow our egos and do what's in the best interest for our parents and for us in the akhirah, inshallah. Jazakallah um, khair. Well, I mean, like really, I think we avoided a round of applause in this whole session simply because of the topic and the sensitivity of the topic. But Sheikh, you just came off a plane. I'm going to ask you one question because you did come off a plane. I do feel bad for you, but you know, I'm pretty messed up. I'm still going to yeah, ask you, you one more. Uh, yeah. So I'm still going to ask you one more question. And then shall after that we can leave. Sheikh, like, you know, we hope, and, uh, n n you know, all of you, Mashaikh, that you guys made your parents very proud. And on the Day of Judgment, your parents, the rankings in their akhirah will be beyond what they could have imagined because of your service to the deen. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِمَانَ الْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ وَمَا أَلَتْنَاهُمْ مِنْ عَمَلِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ Like, that's, inshallah, there's no doubt in that. And Allah, Allah was continue doing that for ourselves and for our parents. Sheikh, if you don't mind, because you've committed your life to this, you, you know, you've, you much, I, I'm not sure the age difference between you and Sheikh Naveed, but I know you're way older than me, like you old, Sheikh. <laughs> but but um, that being said, can you tell all of us youngsters how important it is to simply be a source of the benefit for our parents' akhirah. Like, how can we use that as a motivation? How can we think about that when we're dealing with them? How can we think about that when we're making decisions and moving forward in life? If you don't mind sharing some thoughts on that, Sheikh. <sighs> SubhanAllah. Um, before I answer your specific question, the whole notion of parents being proud and being uh, happy at what you've done. Listen, I also want to teach you facts and truth, right? And I know, alhamdulillah, right now, alhamdulillah, my parents are so happy and proud, and I'm, I'm very humbled at that. But my story is public. I've said this multiple times. When I first decided to go to Medina, my father did not want me to go to Medina. This was way, the world was a different. Many of you weren't even born back then. This is 1994. Sure, I mean, don't so, give your age. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm almost going to turn 50 soon, so oh, that's okay. my age. Like, so I have no, no embarrassment of my age, subhanAllah. Alhamdulillah. Zakallah. But of course, what is age? I identify as 25. <laughs> It's only a matter of time, bro, that happens. <laughs> and I think that's an identification we might actually be Except. sympathetic to. Yeah, okay, alhamdulillah. I say this because I want to teach you raw facts. A time will come when you might have to gently part ways with your parents' decisions about your life. I had to do that. And had it not been for that, I would not be sitting here right now. And I had to do it trusting, not only am I doing the right decision, but that I'll gain my father's trust back. Not his love, he always loved me. But the confidence and trust, he really thought I was going down a wild goose chase. Even though, as you, if you know my father, you know, he's been an activist his whole life. His whole life's not as if, no. But he just felt this is not the right thing to do. You give up your engineering career, you have a Dow chemical offer, everything is on the table, and you're just gonna go some, you know, faraway place. And, and he just didn't, in his understanding, like, you can do this part-time, mm. right? And be an activist part-time, and be a, you know, person in society full-time. And it was one of the most difficult decisions for me to have to make. It was the first time in my life where I literally had to gently say, no, mm. I'm not going to do this now, I'm gonna do this. And I say this because, again, I want to teach you facts. I don't want to teach you some raw theory out there. If and when such a situation comes in your lives, you had better be sure you're making the right decision in the eyes of Allah. Because if you don't have Allah's blessings, then how are you going to stand up against a possible parent not like, liking your decision? Think about this, right? You really have to be certain that you're doing this for the right reason. 
that this is really in the best interest of deen and dunya combined, whatever the decision might be. And if you really feel so, pray istikhara and talk to lots of people whom you trust. And when that time comes where you have to tell your mother or father that you're actually going to do a different decision, make sure the language you use and the mechanism you use is itself not going to be long-term damaging. Because it is possible the decision might easily be forgiven, but not the way you went, went about enforcing it in their lives. So all of us, because again, I mean, the technical fiqh stuff, guys, I didn't listen to what you guys said before I obviously came in, but the technical fiqh stuff, this is going to cause a lot of drama, but it is factually correct. It is not wajib to obey parents. It is wajib to respect parents. There's a massive difference between the two. And a lot of times what we are taught growing up, you must obey the parents. No, I challenge you to find anywhere in the Quran and Sunnah obedience to parents unconditionally. No, that doesn't make any sense. Your parents visit your house, they don't like your furniture, they say, oh, change all your furniture. That's an unreasonable demand, right? Obedience to parents is contingent on a number of factors and conditions, as Ibn Taymiyyah said. And I have a longer lecture about that. But what you're never allowed to do is be rude to your parents. That's what you're never allowed to do. So a time will come when you're 21, 25, 30 years old maybe even. Of course, as you grow older, that tension gets less and less. But there is that awkward middle ground where you are fully an adult, but emotionally you're acting like a child. Mm. And you are biologically an adult, but your parents are treating you like, like a child, right? There is that awkward, around five years or so, generally speaking. And during the, that time is when, frankly, most of the arguments and most of the issues happen. From 18 to 23, 24, right? Like when you're actually physically, mentally an adult. And you want to make a decision. Now again, some big decisions are career choices. Where you're going to work. What if you get a job in another city? Marriage. Choice of partners. That's a massive decision, right? Your parents do not have the right to emotionally pressure you to marry your lifelong partner. <laughs> that touched off a raw nerve there. Okay. <laughs> Some daughter mother have to have a deep conversation on that side afterwards. Okay. I'm not going to go there. And I was not paid by, for anybody for doing that. Okay. But... You don't. I mean, they don't have that right. They just don't have that right. Now, if the time comes where you have to make a decision, that is not their decision. And I say this because, again, you already phrased the question as if parents are all going to be lovey-dovey throughout your lives. No. What made me who I am was something I had to literally, gently, and alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful to Allah. The way I did it was very, alhamdulillah, in hindsight, it was the best thing I could have done. Very gently, very... <laughs> I would like to buy him flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so, this also shows you the difference between a teenager and an adult. When I was an actual teenager, the first idea to go to Medina came to me in 1991 92. And I was still like a you know, sophomore in university. And I wanted to drop my education, give up everything, right, and go and apply to Medina. And my mother was supported from day one. Moms are soft, mashallah. My mother was like from day one. I'm behind you, I'm saying, yeah. And when I told my dad, he just like flat out said, no, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. And of course, I'm 17 years old. Financially, I'm totally dependent on them, right? I mean, you are, you are, see here's the point, 17, biologically you're an adult, but emotionally and financially you are a child. I'm sorry to be blunt, sisters and brothers, until you start earning your own living, and until you have to worry about paying your own bills, sorry, you're not an adult. Until you have to start, no, no, no clapping now. <laughs> so at the age of 17, my father said no, and the voice and tone and the, con the, 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 the context of my life, that no means no, right? And I literally acted like a teenager, screaming, crying, tantrum, 
17-year-old tantrum. Mm. The, the worst type of tantrum. And I literally said, this is shaitan's putting a bad idea into your health. I'm the one yelling and screaming. <laughs> He's the one being sensible, right? And at a 17-year-old, semi-fanatic, because the real fan fanaticism began at the University of Medina, but 17-year-old, <laughs> I don't know the guy, sorry, okay. 17-year-old, and I'm the one saying to him, shaitan has deceived you. I want to make a good decision, and shaitan's clouding your brain by telling you that I shouldn't go to Medina, right? This is a 17-year-old. This is a very personal story. Please don't put this online, guys. I'm telling you personal stories here. I'm, you, 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 you really put, caught me at a stage where I'm not, you know what I'm saying? Jayid. So, my, so when I started arguing with him back and forth, he said to me, and I, and wallahi, may Allah grant him firdaus just for this one statement, the profundity of it blew me away even at that stage. Mm. Even at that stage, when I was yelling and crying, the profundity blew me away. What did he say? He goes, you are my responsibility until you're able to stand on your own two feet. Once you're able to stand on your own two feet, you can do as you please. And even as a crying, tantrum-filled 17-year-old, I was like, dang, that's profound, Baba. <laughs> okay. I was like, dude, that's deep. That's deep. Okay. And he just said that to me blunt, right? And subhanAllah, I absorbed it. Graduated magna cum laude, had the Dow Chemical offer. And I said to him, Baba, you said to me that your responsibility was to have me stand on my own two feet. Here I am. I can take this offer because I had an offer from Dow Chemical and an offer from Medina Medina on the table at the same time. Literally, it's an iconic moment from my life. And literally, it was like one of those, you know, two, two pieces of paper, you know, the Barqiya from Jamia ah back in the day, right? And the, the offer from Dow, both was there. And I said to my father, like, you know, I, I respected your decision. And you told me that once I'm able to stand on my feet, I can make my decision. And then, and that's the maturity, and I've made my decision. It really is about context and confidence. Now the tables have turned. Because that was the condition he put on me. No tantrum, no crying. And I say this all the time when I speak to the youth. You want to be treated like an adult? Maybe start acting like an adult. So that was my story. Anyway, so... But, <laughs> it's good enough, bro. I'm good, good, good enough. Um, no, no, no. no. I, I'm, I'm perfectly fine. This is a beautiful story, Sheikh. I appreciate you sharing that story. Uh, it's late. It's, you, why, why are you guys like, it's not that late, man. It's 10 30. So, I'm just messing with you guys. Um, these guys, look, the audience, you guys, um, this is the first day here. They don't know we end at like at 12 a.m. every night. We got room. This is this is how it runs over here in the knowledge retreat. Welcome, uh, but you're right. It is very late. May Allah go ahead, One second. I actually came honestly because tomorrow I have another class about the Quran. I'm not going to be able to do this. I wanted to just give two three minutes of advice about what's going on in Gaza. Uh, I wanted to talk about. That's literally why I came here. So if you I, if you allow me to change the topic and just go a little bit more uh, blunt in this regard. So. Before you get into that, can I actually just share a story? Oh, okay. That'll be a very quick two stories. Just before we conclude the topic. Okay. Look, there has been a lot of heavy discussions, a lot of tears shed. Um, I, I think it's important to highlight two very quick stories. Um, I've spent a lot of time with the Wahid brothers over the past two years now, alhamdulillah. There's a running joke that I'm the, the sixth brother. Um, but I had a serious conversation with the brothers that what was it, the, the brother that passed away, rahimahullah, what was it that made him the mother's most favorite child. And you may think it may be something profound, like he must have done something so great that made him the most beloved. But it was the simple thing of, none of the brothers would consistently answer the mother's phone, except for this brother. She called instantaneously, he would pick up the phone. And you often think that you have to do these grandiose gestures for your parents, it's not it. It's the small things that we would consider insignificant that mean the world to them. When they're feeling they're loneliest and you're there for them, it means the world to them. And number two, you know, subhanAllah, till the moment that she uh, passed away, rahimahullah, my mother used to continuously make dua for, for Sheikh Yasser. And again, what was it that he did? You may think all the lectures that he's done, all the da'wah that he's done, Nope. In fact, she agreed with him on so many matters, dis disagreed with him on so many matters. <laughs> but, but, when Sheikh Yasser came to Montreal, my mother was at uh, the footsteps of the masjid in, in the car. 
Sheikh, Sheikh Yasser came down all the stairs, and it was like 20, 30 st stairs, came all the way down to specifically give her salams in the car. And to her, that meant the world. Allahu Akbar. Right? So again, it's those small things that we may think are insignificant to us that leave a long-lasting impact. And I think that's the point that we want to conclude with, that there is no deed that is too small, that is great in the sight of Allah and great in the sight of our parents that will completely you know, change their realities. So I want to leave that uh, with all of you, inshallah, before we change the topic. Zakallah khair. Sorry, guys, I'm going to change the topic completely to something else, but Zakallah khair. Uh, the reason is that literally, I know I'm not going to be able to talk about this tomorrow because it's another module and I'm not going to be able to come after this. Um, for the last four and a half months since Gaza began, every single khutbah dars topic has somehow linked to Gaza for me. And I encourage you to listen to as many of them as you can because I'm trying my best to be holistic and not just what do we do in Gaza? No, like history lessons and anecdotes and incidents, just being broader about this. And one of the things that has happened for me I've actually become far more blunt about certain problems that I was hesitant to bring up and talk about. And we don't have the luxury, we don't have the opportunity to start ignoring those problems. Gaza has really shown a light on many issues that we'd rather try to cover up. And of them, frankly, is that number one, without a doubt, we have been unprepared. We have been blissfully disconnected from a type of activism that we need to start becoming far more involved with. It is truly pathetic, frankly, that in the Western world our numbers are so high and yet the very countries we live in are the propagators of these types of injustices. And I'm sorry to be blunt here, but at some level this is a failure of leadership and that I, I don't excuse myself as well. At some level, this is a failure of all the movements. At some level, this is a failure of vision. As we're obsessed with some aspects, which maybe we should be obsessed with, clearly we have neglected many other aspects that we should have also been talking about. And I think this situation now, and I just did a tour of Europe, Almost every city I went to, 10% or more is Muslim. London, 10% Muslim. Mississauga, 14% Muslim. Toronto as a whole, 10% Muslim. Stockholm, 10% Muslim. Vienna, 10%, 11%. Vienna, 11% Muslim. Oslo, 11% Muslim. Paris, 18%. I'm sorry, but something is wrong when our demographics are so many and yet our countries are disconnected from the sentiments that we feel and we're supposed to be a democracy, we're supposed to be an institution where our sentiments are translated into reality. And the sheer inhumanity of our current administration, the sheer, I mean the depravity, wallahi, the sheer depravity of not even wanting to issue a statement. Just words. And they don't want to do that. Just a letter from Alg Algeria and they veto that. I'm sorry, what the heck are we doing? How can this take place? How? And that leads us to the awkward reality that what exactly are we doing? Frankly, and I'm sorry to be blunt here, I'm going to try to be careful, too careful, not, not too explicit. We are all looking backwards and regurgitating that which we're comfortable with. And very few of us are thinking forwards and trying to answer solutions, trying to give solutions to problems that we're currently facing. We find comfort in the tradition, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but after we find some comfort, let us get the bravery we need to think about tomorrow. And I think this is our fundamental problem. And this is manifested in multiple ways. Of them, frankly, and again, this is an awkward topic. Our inner disunity 
and our fear of ourselves when anybody dares say something that doesn't quite conform with what I have been taught is orthodoxy. And if at this stage of the game, if at this stage of the game when bombs are dropping, children are dying because they don't have water, and your main pet peeve is who's on and off and who's correct and who's wrong, which opinion is this and that, then either, number one, you are planted from outside, or number two, your IQ is in the single digits, not in double digits. Wallahi, there's no third option. There is no third option. We have to start being brave enough to think about tomorrow. What does it mean to be an American Muslim? What does it mean to live in the Western world? How do I balance all of these different identities? How do I contribute without being corrupted? Listen, I don't know, but I do know one thing. Somebody has to stand up and talk about it. Somebody has to push you guys forward. If I'm wrong, if other people are wrong, go ahead and correct me gently from within. But don't make us the enemy simply because we're trying to deal with reality as it is. We're not going to solve our problems by quoting Ibn Taymiyyah Ghazali Ar-Razi. That's for 10, 20, 30% of our alaqat and durus. For the rest of them, we have to solve problems of today. I need to figure out how to stop my own country from enabling genocide. And the way we're going to do this is not by going back to the classical books. Believe me, I love tradition. Believe me, we're not trying to diss the tradition. We're not trying to reform Islam, a'udhu billah. We're trying to solve modernity's problems. And in order to do that, we have to go where our scholars did not go because we're living in times they did not live. Please, O oh Muslims, get some maturity, get with the act. Either help in the conversation or else make dua for us. There is no third option right now. Really, there's no third option. Come together, unify as much as we can. Wallahi, the world is being divided into two camps and that's it. A camp that is for humanity, a camp that cares about children and babies, a camp that cares for truth, and a camp that's heart is so cold, they don't care about bombing. The, the amount of bombs that have been dropped in that small land is more than per capita Vietnam, more than what happened in Afghanistan. And here we are debating and splitting fine hairs over abstract issues of controversy a thousand years ago. I'm sorry, get over it. My expertise is aqidah. Please don't tell me I don't know aqidah. If you think right now we have to discuss istawa ala rash and what is the correct opinion, if you think right now how to discuss the anwa al qadr and kasab and what this means and what not, save 20% of your durus, no problem. Do that, yes. And even as you do it, do it with tolerance. Don't hate on the others from a thousand years ago. We're not supposed to be carrying the hatred of a thousand years ago today. Get over it. We have a thousand years of history. People agree to disagree, people differ. Now let's move on. At this stage of the game, these classical groups mean nothing to us. These movements have no relevance anymore. With utmost love and respect, all the movements of the last century that we all identify with. I'm saying this politely. At least in this area, they have failed us. I'm not saying they're failures. Please don't misquote me. But in this area of contributing and giving back to our societies and helping our countries and societies be better, more ethical, none of these classical movements, and, and, and by the way, why should they? Why, how could anybody a hundred years ago tell us a template about living Islam in America? It is our short-sightedness that we think going back to a mujaddid of the 17th century, a great alim of the 18th century, a, a, a great figure and zahid of the 19th century, that that person is the only person that's going to solve the pr problems of the 21st century. You really want to admire Ibn Taymiyyah Ghazali Ar-Razi? Don't just quote them. Do what they did. Do what they did for your time and place. And if you do so, wallahi, I will respect you. And if you're sincere, you're with the ummah, you make some mistakes. In the, those mistakes, at least we're going to see what not to do. Yaqi, nobody's saying I'm going to be perfect, your others are going to be perfect. But we have to push the narrative forward. And we have to think outside the box. And we have to give some solutions to modernity's problems. And all that we ask of you, your love and dua and support, that's it. Stay with us, stay with the community, help us. If we make a mistake, gently correct us. If we're correct in what we do, support us in this regard. But stay together as an ummah. Do not divide. 
This is what I'm, the Allah has commanded us to do. So in light of Gaza, wallahi for me, Gaza is a huge wake-up call. A wake-up call for all of us here. The tragedies that we're seeing take place, it is unbelievable. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our brothers and sisters in Gaza. May Allah give them sabr and nasr and support. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use them to inspire us to gain more maturity, to become activists, to think long-term. Solutions might not even be today. Salah al-Din Yawbi didn't come out of a vacuum. 90 plus years, 90 plus years before Salah al-Din came. And I've given multiple talks about that interim. Go listen to that. In that interim, one of the things that Nuruddin Zangi did, I've mentioned this on Miftah's platform, is that he built 17 madrasas. Nuruddin Zangi built 17 madrasas. Why? Because when Salah al-Din finally entered Jerusalem, he needed an army that loved Jerusalem, even though that army was an Arab. That army had never prayed in Jerusalem. Salah Adin himself was Kurdi. Salah Adin himself was a Kurd. How are you going to get those people? By love of Allah and His Messenger in their hearts. Think long term. Think long term. Don't think victory is tomorrow. And everybody do something. Be a part of the solution. Don't be a part of the problem by nitpicking and by dividing and by disuniting. No. Wallahi, this is not the time to do that. Make dua to Allah for ikhlas. Make dua to Allah what is the best way forward. And then do something. Do something for the ummah. And in that effort, inshaAllah ta'ala, will be our success. That's what I came to say. Zakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Zakumullahu khair. Dua. Takbir. Takbir. Takbir, may Allah bless you all, reward you all. Um, in Zakallah khair for coming out. Sheikh, if can one of the Mashayah just make a short dua, 10 seconds, 20 seconds? I, I, I nominate both of you. nominate. nominate. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, you're going to argue about it. <laughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allahumma laka alhamdu kullu, wa laka shukru kullu, wa ilayki arjul amru kullu, ala anayi tawassiru. Allahumma laka alhamdu hatta tarda, wa laka alhamdu idha radid, wa laka alhamdu ba'da rida. Allahumma sari ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept our gathering here tonight, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you to give us knowledge that will benefit the state of our Ummah, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you to give us the ability to rectify the affairs of our families, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you to give us the knowledge and the hikmah and the bravery, Ya Allah, to be courageous, Ya Allah. Give us the, the shuja'a, Ya Allah, that we need in order to stay, change the state and affairs of our country, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you to inspire us, Ya Allah, with knowledge from you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, so that we can pave the path for those that are coming after us, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we beg of you, we ask of you, we turn to you, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, with crying hearts, Ya Allah, we ask you. Ya Allah, alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Gaza, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we beg of you, we ask of you, we turn to you, Ya Rahman Rahim. We ask you, Ya Allah, to grab the hands of the oppressor, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to turn their plots against them, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to comfort those who have lost loved ones, Ya Allah. Ya Allah, we ask you to accept those who have died as shuhada, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you, we beg of you, Ya Allah. In this moment, Ya Allah, we feel helpless, but we are never hopeless because we have you, Ya Rahman Rahim. Ya Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to guide us, Ya Allah. Inspire us, Ya Allah. Guide us, Ya Rahman Rahim, so that we can be a part of the change that we need in this Ummah, Ya Rahman Rahim. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifun. Wassalamun ala al-Mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Yeah, exactly.